Is your life limited by the labels the world and other people have used to define you? Labels you have internalized and apply to yourself every day. Labels like afraid or addict, orphan, damaged goods, failure, maybe even religious. These labels might be sewn into your life with such tight little stitches that they feel like a part of you. They feel like they define you, but that's a lie. If you let him, Jesus can remove those old labels and tattoo new ones onto your soul. Then you'll begin to see yourself as God the Father sees you. The limits will be lifted. Your life will be transformed, a limitless life. Well, good morning. How you guys doing this morning? Good, good. Well, I'm, so, I'm glad that you're here today. We're going to start a brand new series called Limitless Life, as you can see up on the screen. Um, now, some of the influence for this um, sermon series actually came from a book that's by the same title, Limitless Life, by a guy named Derwin Gray. So I want to give him credit just for this um, before we get started. But really, the majority of where this all came from is actually from my lifelong verse. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, a lifelong verse? Like, what, what, what's that? And um, some of you, though, you're like, yeah, I've got one of those, too. And so I tell you what, if, if that's you, I would love to know what your lifelong verse is. So if you've got one on your welcome card, would you just down in the prayer section, would you just write the reference to it for me so that I can look at that this week? Because I would love to know what your lifelong verse is. My lifelong verse comes from John chapter 3, verse 34, and uh, it's something that I read shortly after God called me to be a pastor. I think that I've shared this before in this room, um, talking about this idea about when um, I was a teenager and God moved in my life. He, he called out to me. Um, in fact, um, sometimes we talk about this idea of God talking to us. Um, we get this weird idea. We think about like Old Testament sort of thing like, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, it's not kind of that sort of thing though, right? When we're talking about that, we're talking about like this, um, this deep down inside. It's almost like a gut feeling, but it's so much more than that. It's some conviction that goes along with that fact. Sometimes, maybe you've been sitting in a room kind of like this, and a pastor's given the uh, the invitation, right? The moment where he says, hey, listen, if you want to become a Jesus follower, that's how we say it here. If you want to step out and say yes and respond to Jesus, and you're sitting there, and you're like clinging to the back of the chair, nails digging in, because you know deep down inside of you that God is talking to your heart at that moment. That's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. And so there was a point in my life I had already said yes to Jesus and following him had been on that for path for several years. And I had another moment where God like just gripped me, got a hold of me and said, hey, listen. And he was speaking straight into me and calling me towards something. And I was like, OK, God, what what is that? And I and after wrestling with it. I came to understand that he was saying, listen, I want you to do what you're doing right now. Charles, is, he was calling me to that 20 years ago. So this is why I have a plan for you that looks like this. And I was, I have to be honest with you, um, I was a little bit scared as a teenager to hear, hey, I, I want you to um, pastor a church at some point in time in your life. And I'm going to do everything it takes to prepare that. And, and so... As you can imagine, when, when you have something like that that happens, you begin to spend some more time in God's Word, right? You begin to have some, some personal quiet time, some personal study time, because that's where our relationship with God is developed. And so I was diving in on the backside of having that calling in my life, and I was in the book of John, right? John's an incredible book. It was written by one of Jesus' followers. In fact, John calls himself the beloved one, right? So he's telling you that he was the most loved. He was the favorite son out of all the disciples. Yeah, some of you are nodding your heads because you're like, yeah, I'm that one in my family. I'm not, so I have some disdain towards this, all right? Because really John and Peter like competed for this sort of title. And I'm a little bit more like Peter because I know that somebody else in my family is the loved one. It's my sister. Um, if you're watching Annie, I'm sorry. I love you, but it's a true story, all right? Um, so, but... I, I was looking at this, and I, I came to the third chapter. Now, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them up, because we're going to look at this together. And I'm just going to, for a second, I'm going to just, while you're flipping there, I want to give you a small side note on something. 
Because every week I say to you, hey, if you've got your Bibles, open them up. Um, and I tell you that we're going to put it up on the screen. And I do that because uh, for somebody that maybe doesn't have it or somebody who's like, man, I'm not real comfortable. I'm, I'm flipping to it real fast. Or I don't know what version it is that he's going to be using. But um, I want you to know that I think it's important for us to look at things in the Bible for ourselves. In fact, I think it's important that you see it in your own Bible and go, well, wait a second. My version's not the same as his version, so why does mine say this? Why does that a little bit different? You know, when you let me put it up on the screen, I can say whatever I want to say on the screen, right? If you don't open it up and look at it, I can tell you that, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow up on the screen, and you'd be like, well, what do you know? Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Right? I, it's important that you be able to go. In fact, some of my greatest heroes, right, about 400 years ago, they fought an incredible battle in order to be able to say that you could do that. Because in Germany and England and Italy, I'm not talking about like third world country sort of thing. I'm talking about like established countries. They had a belief that said, listen, people can't handle God's word. They don't need it. They don't know how to, how to do anything with it. They don't know how to interpret it. And so they need somebody to interpret it for them. And these heroes of my life, they said, no, that's not true. They said, all that you need is a Holy Spirit. And he's the one who then interprets all of this for each and every one of us. And so really, in reality, as a pastor, I'm sitting here telling you, you don't need me. It's a great thing for a pastor to say, by the way, right? You don't need me. Because the word of God is powerful, it's living, it's true, and it's able to impart knowledge and things for you to be able to apply without somebody like me. And I firmly, firmly believe that. My desire and my goal is not to create Charles followers. I don't need a whole bunch of Pastor Charles followers. My job, the thing that I have, has been laid on my heart is for you to be a Jesus follower. And the place that we do that is by spending time in the Word and having that personal relationship. I can't have a relationship with Jesus for you. It's yours. All right, I've so fucked this enough. So I was doing exactly that. Right? I'm telling you it's important, and here it is. I was doing exactly that. I was having my own personal, quiet time, reading, studying, all for the purpose of growing closer and having a relationship with Jesus. And I came to this particular verse in John chapter 3. Now let me set the stage a little bit before we see um, these verses that we're going to look at, and uh, one that we're going to highlight today. Jesus started his public ministry here in John chapter 3. In fact, one of my favorite stories is right there at the very beginning of John chapter 3 about a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is um, a Pharisee, and he comes and meets Jesus in the middle of the night. Nicodemus is like a congressman. Can you imagine, uh, you know, some sort of a pastor, let alone Jesus, meeting with a congressman? It'd be, I mean, it seems like a conflict of interest on both sides, right? Yeah, that's kind of how it was for Nicodemus. And so they have this conversation after that. Then Jesus goes back out, and he's baptizing people. In fact, he hooks back up with John the Baptist, his cousin, right? And then he moves on down the way from where John is at, and he's doing his own thing. And while he's doing that, right, apparently not only did Jesus move, but all the people moved with Jesus. Whereas everybody had been coming to see John in order to get baptized, they're now all going to see Jesus. And one of John's disciples comes to him. I think you can kind of imagine what's going on. It's a little bit distraught. He's got some distress in his voice as he's talking to, to John. Because he's like, John, um, that guy who you like said was a good guy, right? You, you declared him as something. He was here in our midst, and, and we were doing some stuff. He's moved on, and everybody's with him now. And he, I think he kind of like has this like expectation that John's going to be like, yeah, you know, the people just go wherever the people want to go. Or like, he, I think he's like looking for some sort of comfort on all of this. And John takes this moment. John takes this moment in order to disciple this guy, to help push him a little bit closer to what Jesus is all about. 
And so John says, well, that, that guy, Jesus over there, right? He says, he says, you know, first of all, about me, that I'm not the Messiah. He says, you know that I've said that he's the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for, the one that's coming. And then John drops one of perhaps the most iconic biblical lines of all time. In fact, we, we see this line all the time. You're going to recognize it when I say it. But in chapter 3, verse 30, he says this. He says, he, that being Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. Now, you've probably seen it in our modern context uh, converted into a little bit of a math equation, right? Looks a little bit like this. He is greater than I, right? That he has to continue to be bigger and better and, and more important. And as he becomes that, then I become even less. And John's saying that about his own life. Now we could sit here and talk about just that idea right there, right? That's a whole lot to chew on, that he must increase and that I must decrease. Because John's not just talking about his own physical thing that's going on. Yeah, there's, there's a physical moment of what he's talking about, about his own physical ministry that's going on. He's saying, listen, my time is going to come to an end. And it, as it does, you need to understand that his is going to ramp up and his is what it's all about. Not about me, it's all about him. So there's there's certainly that, but really on a on a deeper level, John is is making a statement about all of our own spiritual journeys. That in our lives, after we come to Jesus and acknowledge him as the one who is Messiah, the one who has come, the anointed one, the one who has proclaim to bring the kingdom of heaven to us and offer eternal life. And once we've accepted that, that we no longer get the platform ourselves, but we're all about platforming him. And that spiritually we begin a journey that is an increasing of him and a decreasing of us. But that is not where my life verses come from. You're like, that's good. And it's like, it is good. It would have been, that would be good, Right? But, and that would be a really good series, by the way. He must increase and I must decrease. And we may have to have that as a series sometime in the near future. But, um, but in verse 33, just a couple verses later, right? John says this. He says that whoever receives Jesus' testimony sets his seal to see this, that God is true. In other words, he says that whoever believes what Jesus is saying puts their mark or their approval on it saying that God is true. Okay? I love how the message does it. The message is a good paraphrase of stuff, and it says this. It says no one wants to deal with these facts. I love that, right? It's a great start. And here's the facts. It's saying that Je what Jesus is saying about the things above and that he's from above and that he knows about things that are above, right? And then he goes on, he says, but anyone who examines this evidence will come to stake his very life on it. That God himself is the truth. That's good. And then here it is, the verse that has shaped me and continues to shape me and really is the beginning of everything for this series. It's the very next verse, verse 34, and I'm going to give it to you out of the NIV. Normally I preach out of the ESV. You're like, what's the difference between ESV and NIV? Well, not a lot, right? But NIV is a little bit more reader-friendly. And so as a teenager, I was reading through in my own personal time something that was a little bit more reader-friendly. And it says this. It says, For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, and God gives the Spirit without limits. I love that. You see, from the very moment that I read that verse, I was like, God, I... I know that you are sending me out. I understand that John, who's, who's talking right here, is talking about Jesus, and that Jesus is the one that's certainly without limits. But he, he says that the one whom God has sent and speaks the words of God, God gives the Spirit without limits. And I was like, God, if, if I can have any prayer 
for the rest of my life, if you've called me to do this, if you've called me out to, to talk about you, to share what you have done in my life, would you give me your spirit without limits? Would you give me this limitless life? What would it look like? What would it look like if this prayer was answered in your own life? What would it look like if God was to pour out his spirit on your life in a way that was fashioned that it did not have any limits? That's exactly what this entire series is going to be about. What that would look like. How do we get to that idea? How do we, if there's a hundred of us here, begin to take on this idea, this belief that God wants to, because he does, and we're going to see that in just a minute. He wants to give us that sort of limitlessness. Bitcoin word. I don't know if that's a real word or not. I may have had a little bit of extras on there. But that's what he wants. And so as we get ready to dive in, I just want to pray together this morning. And then we'll see as we set up this whole series for the next several weeks about what a limitless life looks like. We pray. God, you know my heart. You know my heart better than anybody that's in this room. And God, I, I don't want to only pray for a limitless spirit in my own life, but I want to pray that for everybody that's sitting in this room right now. God, I pray that this series would just ignite some people. In fact, I pray that it would ignite every single person that's in here to, to pursue a life to the fullest with you. Pray that we wouldn't be okay with anything less. true about all people, but I want you to hear it, that it's for yourself. Something about who you are. You may already know this about yourself. Maybe you don't know this about yourself, but I want you to hear it, maybe for the very first time. But did you know that we are namers by nature? We are. We name everything. Now the book of Genesis, which we'll be in again next week, right? We're going to look at a guy named Abraham next week. But in the book of Genesis, which talks about everything in the beginning, it talks about a guy named Adam. And Adam was given a job to name all of the animals. Now, he did that job not just because God gave it to him as a job to do. That's a good reason to do it. But he also did that job because God inherently put inside of him this desire, this need, in order to categorize Right? And define everything that he sees around him. And so it became a joy for him to look at all of these things that were out there and to give it a name. Because inherently, right, really, names are just labels. That's what names are. They tell us something, right? You know, we, uh, some of you know that I've been coaching a high school boys, freshman, and soccer team. And the first day of practice, get out there and I'm working on learning all of the boys' names, right? And so we, uh, we had our first water break. I sent all of the boys um, to go get water. And one of them just stood there. I was like, well, do you not have any water? I mean, it's like 100 degrees outside as we're practicing. He was like, no, I'm good. It's like, well, we, like, everybody else is like over there dying and you're fine. He said, yeah, I don't need that much water. I said, what are you, like a cactus? <laughs> and so, and some of the other boys overheard me say that to him. And all of a sudden, for the rest of practice, his name was no longer Chance. It was Cactus. 
And he had a name that stuck to him, right? Because it kind of like it identified and it. it told me something about who he was. And it's something that uh, all of us could, could relate to and understood. And so thankfully, thankfully, he liked the nicknames. <laughs> right? Sometimes we pick up nicknames that we don't like. But he liked that, that nickname. You know, names really are just labels. They're a way for us to just categorize and to um, catalog, catalog things. And in some ways, right, this is really good. Labels can be um, really helpful to help us to separate things, like good things from bad things. Recently, my wife has begun to label the leftovers in our refrigerator. That is a good thing in my house, right? If I know that something is from three weeks ago, Friday, I won't eat it. If I know it was from two days ago, there's a good chance I will eat it. But when there were no labels in there, I would forget. Was this from this Monday? Was this from last Monday? Does that have green fuzzy stuff on it? Do we need to throw that away now? Those labels have been incredibly helpful to us to separate those things out about what is good and what is bad. In fact, these labels, they kind of help to establish some limits, right? Now, labels, they strive to define something, right? Labels strive to establish a limit. That's really the whole point of a label, is it helps us to, to, to understand and to, um, to put this as being part of X, whatever that is, our desire to put them into a group. But the trouble is, is not all labels are good, right? We know that to be true. Um, even though we are namers by nature, not all the names that we pick up in the course of our life are good. Like maybe you were young and you were a little bit larger and somebody called you fat. And it's a name that you picked up somewhere along the way. Maybe you struggled with some sort of a past sin. And before long, that sin, whatever it was, becomes to identify who you are or what you do. Maybe your parents said something to you out of anger, right, in a moment, and it created some deep hurt inside of you, and whatever it was that they said was a label that you picked up and put on your life. But labels don't just come to us when we're young, right? They can happen anytime. Maybe you're at work and your boss says to you that your ideas just aren't good enough. You're not cutting it any longer with what it is that you've been doing. And you begin to feel like a failure. And so you pick up the label of failure and you put it on your life. I could go on. There's lots of different ways that we pick up labels and add them to our lives. Lots of different people who say things, who speak things, and we hear them, and we add them onto our lives. In fact, I'll tell you what, on your notes section, this is just for you. I don't want you to turn this in, but this week, I'd love for you in that what did you hear section to just take a moment and say, what are some labels that I've picked up? Labels that I've picked up that are on my life that define some of who I am. Those labels that come to define our lives, let me just be really clear for a second what those are. They're really a soul tattoo. They're not something that we can take off and on, but instead, they become woven deep into the fabric of our being. They determine how we see ourselves. They begin to determine how it is that we live our lives. 
These are the things that ring in our ears at night when we go to bed. These are the things that during the course of the day that we hear somebody else say. That when we, groups are gathered over off to the side, that we hear them saying, whether they're saying it or not, is what we envision that they're saying about us. Because we're not in the middle of the group. In reality, in reality, these are the things that steal life from us. These negative labels. You know, just a few chapters after where this verse is found, Jesus talks about the same idea. Now, this first time, remember, it was John the Baptist that was talking, but this second time, it's Jesus who's talking, and he says this. He says the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, some of you are going, wait a second, that doesn't sound like the same thing about what you're talking about, but hang on, we're going to get there. Because the thief, right, that, that's really how we should describe what these labels are. They are things that are stealing from us. Stealing an identity from us. They're replacing it. They're slowly killing us. They're slowly destroying us. Now, if you were here this fall, we did a series called Happy. What makes you happy? And in that series, we talked about the fact that thief, the thief that Jesus is talking about here is anybody who steals any of your happiness. Anybody who kills any of your future potential, anybody who wants to destroy what it is that God wants you to be. And here's what we learned in the course of that is, is that the person who has the most potential for doing that is you. I am my own worst enemy. So we become our own thief. As we steal these different labels and attach them into our lives. Fixate on them. And we sow them deeper and deeper in. And we allow them to define us and to make us miserable. Let me go back to the food label idea for just a second. Because I want to highlight one other thing about labels before we go on to what Jesus said. If I place a date of February 2nd on a container of milk that doesn't expire until February the 14th. Right? Some of you are going like, why, why would you do that? Well, here's what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to end up throwing out something that is perfectly good. Right? I don't know about you, but I'm that person that if, if it says February 2nd on it, on January 31st, I'm throwing it away. I've had bad milk before. I don't want to taste it ever again. In fact, I look at the day before I ever begin to pour it, and I can, like, begin to taste that the milk is turning. Anybody else there with me? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that, Ryan. Yeah. So what good would it do if the label is wrong? If the label says something that's not true? Well, if things are mislabeled, they create unhelpful boundaries, right? And they set false limitations. And that's true not only when it comes to milk, but it's true about your life. And it's true about my life. If I put on a label that says failure on it, right? I'm going to begin to limit the successes that I have. 
I'm going to begin to limit the number of people who might think of me as successful. I'm going to begin to limit because of that label. Or if you wear a label of disappointment, right? You're going to limit the number of people who can see you as being anything but that. All of your interactions are going to be flavored with that person must see me as. And the way that they're doing something is because I'm a... And we even begin to allow that to influence how we think God must see us. God must see me as a failure, as hurt, as sinful, and as a thief. Jesus is saying, you're mislabeled. You're mislabeled. Look at what he says in response to the thief. He says, I, right? He says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly or to the fullest. And then he says, the good shepherd, which is him, lays down his life for the sheep. The they. I've come that they may have life. Who's the they in this passage? Well, Jesus says it's the sheep, right? And he says a sheep is anyone who hears my voice and responds to it. Remember that gut feeling that we talked about at the very beginning? Somebody who hears that, who feels that, who knows that God is calling out to them and says, all right, what do I do now? God, how do I respond? The story in the Old Testament about a, a little boy named Samuel. Samuel lays down to go to sleep at night, and, and in the midst of that, God calls out to him. And Samuel thinks, in, he, in fact, he, he's so compelled by this moment that he believes that it's his master that's called out. And so he goes and he runs into Eli and he says, Yes, what do you need? And Eli's bewildered and looks at him like, go to bed. I don't know what to talk about. And it happens two more times. And finally, Eli figures out, he says, God's calling to you. You need to respond to him. And so in that last moment where God finally calls out again, Samuel responds and says, yes, Lord, here am I. What do you want from me? I'll do whatever. He responds to his voice. Jesus says, if you hear my voice, if you know that I'm calling to you, if you respond to me, then really you are mine. That's it. That's all you have to do to no longer wear the negative name tags, the negative labels, to, to get rid of the things that are life-stealing and life-destroying. Because Jesus says, and I love what the last verse of that, that we read, that the good shepherd lays down his life. The whole reason that he did that is so that he could purchase all of the labels that were destroying and killing and wanted to steal all of your life. He purchased all of those off of you. Now, I don't want us to get confused for a second. Jesus is not a tattoo cover-up artist, right? I don't want us to begin to think that Jesus, when we say yes to him, he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to begin to cover up all of those things so that you'll just look better to God. That's not what Jesus came for. It's not what he came to do. He didn't come to cover up everything. Paul, and as Paul describes himself later on in the New Testament, he tells you, I'm the cheapest of every bad label that you could ever wear. I'm it. He's like, I was a murderer. I was a destroyer. I was out and set against God. And then he says, but God came into my life. He called out to me and I responded and he made me a brand new creation. He says he took all of those other things off of me. He made me new. So that no longer was I defined by any of those labels. In fact, in the book of Revelation, 
Jesus says, I'm going to give you a rock with a new name on it. A new name. I'm going to relabel you. And the rest of the series, we're going to talk about some of the things that Jesus wants to label you with. And we're going to see four examples of people who lived that out in their life. Somebody who had limitless faith. You're like, I'm just not sure if I can believe that. That's great. We're going to start. <laughs> we're going to start with the person who, by the end of their life, whatever it was that God asked of them, they were willing to do it. And we're going to walk through how did they get there. We're going to see somebody that had limitless grace. You've been wrong before. You've wanted to get back at somebody. And this person, this person showed an abundance of grace in a moment when they didn't have to. In a moment where most of us would say the other way was the better way to go. We're going to look at that. Then we're going to see somebody that because of having that faith and because of having that grace that they receive limitless wisdom. You ever wanted to be wise? You ever wanted to be able to know the right things to do at the right times? We're going to look at what it would be like to have limitless wisdom in your life. Jesus wants that for you. He wants you to have it. And we're going to talk about what do we do to get there. And finally, we're going to look at when you add all of those together that you end up at limitless love. What does that look like in your life to be able to love your neighbor as yourself? We don't have much limits on loving ourselves most times, guys. That's what we want. That's what we're going to be diving into. So don't miss out. It's going to be a great series, right? I'm just setting it all up today. All of this about the limits that we place on our own lives and about how Jesus says, I want to tear all of that down. I want to help you live it to the fullest. A life that doesn't know any limits. I want to give you the same spirit that I had that let me be without limits. So that you can be too. What an awesome moment it's going to be. I'm looking forward to it. Don't miss out. Bring your friends. They need to hear about it. They're going to be excited about hearing about this idea. So come back next week, right? As we talk about limitless faith why we want it how we get there what it means for our lives let's pray Jesus what a powerful powerful thing we do pick up these labels we find them all over the place Them deep down into our soul. God, there's times where we don't want them and we try to get rid of them ourselves and we just can't. I love that Jesus said you can. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're sitting in this room right now and You know that you're wearing some labels in your life that are limiting you. And maybe as we were talking today, you heard God calling out to you and saying, come be mine. I've got something so much better for you. Don't walk away without responding. Don't ignore his voice. service, I'll be in the back and we'd be happy to talk to anybody. In fact, you'll find me talking to all kinds of people. Come, share with me that you'd like to respond to God's call in your life today. God, I pray pray that in the next several weeks as we tackle what it would look like to be limitless, 